views you hear expressed today are just those of the panelists and do not uh, reflect the views of the United States Military Academy, Department of Defense, or any agency of the US government. We are really excited about the panel that we've gotten together for you. Um, I am going to turn it over to our uh, moderator, um, Dr. Mike Poznanski, an MWI non-resident fellow in a moment. Um, just to one last reminder that uh, if you do have questions, please save them till the end. You can use the hand raise feature to ask questions, or if you're having trouble with your mic, um, you can type them in the chat and the moderator will call on you. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Poznanski. Great, thanks, Max. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we have you. Okay, so I wanna welcome everybody here for the second panel of the Modern War Institute's uh, 2006 War Studies Conference. I'm Mike Posnanski, an assistant professor in the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Pittsburgh, and a fellow at the Dickey Center at Dartmouth College, and also a non-resident fellow here at the Modern War Institute. This year's conference theme is all about coercion and strategy in an era of great power competition. To be sure, the subject at the heart of this panel, North Korea, doesn't necessarily qualify as a great power according to most standard metrics, it is a regime armed with around 60 nuclear weapons, according to some estimates, and an increasingly sophisticated cyber capability. The 2018 National Defense Strategy states that North Korea's, quote, outlaw actions and reckless rhetoric continue despite United Nations censure and sanctions, unquote. The question before us is what can and should the United States do about it? Fortunately for you all, we have an all-star panel to help us wade through these issues. And before I kick it over to our speakers, I'd like to briefly introduce them in the order they appear in the program, which is to say alphabetically. Our first speaker is Dr. Rupal Mehta, an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. From 2014 to 15, she was a Stanton nuclear security postdoc in the International Security Program and Project on Managing the Atom uh, with the Belfer Center at Harvard Kennedy School. Her first book, Delaying Doomsday, The Politics of Nuclear Reversal, was recently published in the Bridging the Gap series at Oxford University Press. Our second speaker is Mr. Ankit Panda, the Stanton Senior Fellow in the Nuclear Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I'm from Pittsburgh, so I have to say Carnegie and not Carnegie. Uh, Ankit was previously an adjunct senior fellow in the Defense Posture Project at the Federation of American Science Scientists. Uh, and a member of the 2019 FAS International Study Group on North Korea policy. He's the author of Kim Jong-un and the Bomb, Survival and Deterrence in North Korea, which was recently published with Hearst Publishers and Oxford University Press in 2020 and happens to be sitting uh, on my desk right here. Uh, our third speaker is Dr. John Park. He is director of the Korea Project and adjunct lecturer in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center. He's also a faculty affiliate with the Project on Managing the Atom, John's published widely on the political economy of the Korean Peninsula, nuclear proliferation, economic statecraft, Asian trade negotiations, and North Korean cyber activities. He's currently focused on North Korea's regime, the North Korean regime's accumulated learning and evading sanctions, something I'm sure will come up today. And last, but very certainly not least, Honorable Susan Thornton, visiting lecturer at Yale Law School and senior fellow at the Paul Tsai China Center. In 2018, Ms. Thornton retired from the State Department after a impressive 28-year diplomatic career focused primarily on East and Central Asia. In leadership roles in Washington, she worked on China and Korea policy, including stabilizing relations with Taiwan, U.S.-China Cyber Agreement, Paris Climate Accord, and led a successful negotiation in Pyongyang for monitoring of the agreed framework on denuclearization, as you could see a pretty small portfolio. Each of our panelists uh, is going to have up to 10 minutes to speak. What happens if you exceed 10 minutes? I don't know. In a virtual setting, I'll just um, uh, silently judge you. Uh, after which, I'll throw a few questions your way. And then, ideally, we'll open it up to all of you for questions. And we're so pleased to have so many of you joining us today. So we're going to go in the order of the program. Uh, so I'll first turn it over to Rupal, and then uh, Ankit, John, and then Susan. So without further ado, Rupal. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Posnanski, as well as the organizers of this conference. I'm incredibly uh, delighted to be here this morning after I'm sure was a restful, relaxing evening for almost all of us. Uh, I'm pretty excited to also be here to talk about North Korea. Um, as Dr. Posnanski mentioned, 
North Korea is actually one of the sort of strangest uh, countries of concern or adversaries that the United, the United States faces, in part because it's not a near peer competitor. Um, it's actually a regional, it's a minor power, it's a regional power at best, um, but has historically posed a great deal of problems for the United States um, since the start of its nuclear program. If one of the driving questions that has been um, the focus of the nuclear security scholarship and of nuclear security policy since the introduction of nuclear weapons in the international system is how do we stop these countries from trying to acquire nuclear weapons? How do we prevent them if they've already started down the path to acquire nuclear weapons? North Korea probably presents um, the largest obstacle to sort of our full understanding of this question and developing a universal policy or understanding uh, of how these tools and these strategies are effective. That has historically been um, a, a trouble area for US policy and has often been uh, divergent from our expectations, both in scholarship and in policy about what we could expect from adversaries that are not conventional, do not have high conventional superiority, are not major powers in the international system um, and don't have the type of uh, allies or uh, international support that we might expect of other states that pose such a huge threat. In my own research, I sort of take on this question uh, of North Korea and, and to understand um, why it has often failed to uh, live up to our expectations, our theoretical expectations about counterproliferation policy, what some of those challenges have been historically. Um, and I begin my exploration um, with the Clinton administration and the initial development of the agreed framework and ultimately why, why that uh, fell apart. And um, my research actually demonstrates that North Korea, unlike a lot of the other um, adversaries or prior states that we have previously been successful in uh, preventing or stopping their nuclear exploration, North Korea actually faces a series of different challenges that make these types of negotiations um, incredibly difficult. One, of, one is, of course, its regime. Um, North Korea's regime is unlike most other, counter most other proliferators or nuclear aspirants that we have previously dealt with. And second is the fact that um, it does have a state that is um, propping it up. It provides a lot of the resources and support that we would otherwise be withholding through multilateral sanctions or through um, United Nations economic sanctions. So if we were to take on this question of North Korea and start to think about what the next phase of U.S. and North Korean relations will look like, especially depending on how things turn out over the next uh, few days here, as we start to look at what the next few years of U.S. and North Korean relations will look like, I think a few questions emerge for us. One is, is there any opportunity to establish the type of U.S. North Korea deal that the United States was able to implement with Iran in 2015. Is there enough uh, international support? Is there enough with to bring the Chinese on board? And will the North Koreans actually be receptive to uh, establishing a, uh, a negotiation with the United States, especially considering the fallout after the US's uni unilateral withdrawal from the JCPOA um, in, the, uh, in 2018? My research suggests that if the US is able to provide a combination of both carrots and sticks, suggesting that these carrots will be sufficient enough in compensation to over, over uh, outweigh what the North Koreans would otherwise get from continuing their, their nuclear program. This can include uh, other forms of economic relief, diplomatic recognition, as well as some semblance of maintaining a nuclear program, whether it's full scale or whether it's a, it's a more small scale civilian program, some of these tools can be quite effective if used in combination with the threat of uh, an increase in escalatory punishments. And the North Koreans are obviously quite worried about foreign imposed regime change from the United States, but that might be another way of providing these types of rewards and punishments in tandem to prevent them from wanting to continue their nuclear program. The other main a uh, factor that can, can contribute to a successful negotiation is credibility, not just for the United States, but also for North Korea. There's been um, lots of uh, his instances um, in the past decades of both sides abrogating from their agreements. This is something that the United States and North Korea are both going to need to overcome. And of course, the Chinese is going to play, the, the, uh, the Chinese are going to play a huge role in these negotiations um, to help facilitate the United States and potentially the remainder of the P5 
to establishing these negotiations, but also to ensuring that the North Koreans will abide by these agreements. Um, I think from my perspective and from the research that uh, I've done so far and from what we know about the North Korean regime, I'm not incredibly optimistic. I'm incredibly interested to hear um, the remarks from the other panelists that have had the opportunity to study the North Korean regime and Kim Jong-un in particular. Um, but from both the data that we have seen so far, as well as the trends um, throughout the historical record, I'm not uh, incredibly optimistic that we're going to be able to establish one, a long-lasting agreement to suspend uh, North Korea's nuclear program in the same way that, at least for the time being, we were able to achieve some degree of progress and success with the Iranian nuclear program. I do think that we're going to have to overcome a few key obstacles that are quite challenging at this time. Credibility on both actors' part. Um, as well as trying to understand the stop gaps for the uh, North Korean regime, what their primary concerns are, and overcoming some of those concerns, even if it means um, some potential losses for US, for the United States and our own national security, obviously not uh, in, in a military sense, but understanding that some of these negotiations require a different mindset about the perception that of gains, um, relative versus absolute gains, to be able to achieve the type of success that we need to in these negotiations. Um, I also think that um, the, the next few years will determine the overarching um, changes or developments in the nonproliferation regime. We've seen some pretty um, significant threats to the nonproliferation regime over the past few years, including the spread of sensitive nuclear technology. North Korea and what happens with uh, North Korea's nuclear program is likely to be the focal point of the nonproliferation regime moving forward and will set some really key precedents, not just uh, for nuclear aspirants like North Korea and Iran, but for other countries that are looking at the landscape and, and interested in potentially acquiring the early precursor technology for nuclear weapons. Um, I'm incredibly excited to hear what the rest of the panel um, has to say about these topics. And so I, I have a couple minutes left, I think, but I, I'm going to give back my time, I think, so that I can really encourage and foster the uh, engagement and some of the other questions. So thank you, Dr. Fasanti. Dr. Mehta, thank you. An unprecedented move uh, by, by uh, a scholar to seed time. That's wonderful. Um, Ankit, you're next. Terrific. Well, thank you so much uh, to the model. Institute for hosting me today, um, and and Dr. Posnanski for that kind introduction earlier. Um, so I'll 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 try to keep my points succinct um, because what I really want to punch home is for the last thirty years or so we've been talking about North Korea uh, as a non-proliferation problem. Uh, we want to stop this country that has decided that nuclear weapons are in its strategic interest from pursuing these weapons and building them out and. Unfortunately, I think today uh, the nonproliferation framing is not particularly helpful for North Korea anymore. That's not to say that, uh, you know, I'm recommending that we give up on the goal of working towards a Korean peninsula without nuclear weapons. Far from it. Uh, but rather in the short term, uh, we need to recalibrate and re-engineer uh, U.S. policy towards North Korea around the principles of deterrence, containment, and uh, in the short term, working towards managing nuclear risks. Uh, in 2017, something happened uh, uh, in the U.S. strategic community that really hadn't happened in 46 years, give or take. Uh, in 1971, China became the second U.S. nuclear adversary to be capable of ranging the U.S. homeland. Uh, that was the year China tested its DF-5 ICBM, the first Chinese missile capable of ranging the entire United States. In 2017, 46 years later, North Korea conducted two tests of the Hwasong-14 intercontinental range ballistic missile and one test of the Hwasong-15, a larger ballistic missile capable of ranging the entire U.S. homeland. Um, and we've had, you know, endless debates about the technical competency of these delivery systems and of North Korean warheads. Uh, you know, would a reentry vehicle survive uh, its trip to the United States? Um, I think the the technical and engineering questions there are interesting, but for the purposes of deterrence, uh, I think North Korea succeeded in basically showing the United States that it had a rudimentary, minimally capable deterrent. Uh, it has not resolved all the ambiguities around its capabilities. In fact, the current state of ambiguities around North Korea's capabilities in many ways do uh, enhance uh, its ability to deter the United States in many important ways. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, I think that this uh, this has brought us to a place where um, the non-proliferation framing obscures more important short-term priorities. Uh, just uh, in terms of uh, U.S. national security, the security of our allies, 
Um, the uh, the first and foremost challenge, I think, is managing the risks of nuclear escalation on and around the Korean Peninsula. Um, and this wasn't a uh, a major focus of the diplomatic uh, process that began in 2018 and fizzled out in 2019. Um, what I think we did learn, though, and I think we can um, say this with some level of certainty about about Kim Jong Un, at least, uh, is that North Korea has not made a strategic decision to relinquish its nuclear arsenal. Um, to be sure, North Korea releases statements all the time implying that its possession of nuclear weapons is not absolute. Uh, it does condition its possession of these weapons on its external security environment, uh, but it also does imply that the kinds of changes that would be necessary in its external security environment are so bold that they are practically infeasible in the short term. Um, um, this includes um, total global nuclear disarmament. The North Koreans have indicated that they will give up their nuclear weapons when the rest of the world gives up their own nuclear weapons. Um, so where does this leave us? Um, in the meantime, I think what we've seen in North Korea is a process of quantitative growth in the country's nuclear forces, uh, both in terms of fissile material stockpiles, uh, which as Dr. Pustansky indicated in the introduction, has grown to now um, larger than 60 weapons worth of fissile material uh, around 30 or so manufactured nuclear warheads and delivery systems. Uh, we we got a reminder of the latter, of course, uh, last month when the North Koreans held a major military parade really to show the world what they'd been up to uh, in the two years of the diplomatic process uh, that began at the Pyeongchang Winter Olympic Games uh, in February 2018. Um, so. In the short term, then, the next time we talk to the North Koreans, um, and this was a problem in the Singapore and Hanoi summit processes, uh, I think the opening the opening offering that we we approach the North Koreans with uh, when it comes to particularly agreeing on a roadmap uh, for reaching a denuclearized Korean peninsula uh, cannot that 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 roadmap cannot necessarily end uh, or or require the North Koreans to agree to that end state uh, that we seek, which is a a North Korea with no nuclear weapons, because in the short term they intend to retain their nuclear deterrent because they recognize that it gives them a certain degree of leverage in these negotiations, um, and to meaningfully reduce nuclear risks, uh, we need to recognize uh, and talk to the North Koreans about what it means to now coexist as um, as these two countries uh, in, a, in a nuclear armed deterrence relationship. Uh, there is the old cliche in North Korea policy, of course, that uh, there are no good options. You're always looking for the least bad options. Uh, and in many ways, uh, I at least think that this is where U.S. policy will have to go in the short term. Um, what is more controversial uh, is, of course, the recommendation that we pursue some kind of arms control with North Korea. Uh, now, traditionally speaking, arms control is something that we normally think of as something done between superpowers with some level of parity and capabilities. Certainly, this was the case during the Cold War. Um, and with North Korea, as we've just heard, uh, we have an incredible degree of asymmetry, both in conventional and nuclear capabilities. So talking about arms control might not be meaningful, uh, especially if we think about it through the schemas that we know best, uh, uh, particularly in the context of U.S.-Russia strategic arms control. Uh, but that said, I think we need to think about um, I, I, we need to think about and prioritize the steps that we can take to shape North Korea's choices about its nuclear arsenal. Because this is a small country under serious resource constraints, I think the North Koreans are prone to responding to these kinds of incentives. Uh, where I think we will fail, though, uh, is on insisting on complete uh, uh, North Korean disarmament, unilateral disarmament in the short term. Uh, we heard a little bit about carrots and sticks. Um, one point that I will make is that the North Koreans perceive their nuclear weapons as effectively conferring in, um, infinite benefits on the regime. And, and, and by this, I mean that nuclear weapons um, being uh, for the purposes of survival cannot be offset with finite economic or other benefits. Uh, so that, I think, is an important um premise uh, for the way in which we approach this problem. Um, but the kinds of steps we can take to then constrain North Korea's choices, I think, uh, are something that we should give serious thought to. This includes um, thinking carefully about how we posture our own forces uh, in the in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, there are, of course, developments around the corner. And, uh, and here, I think we actually do get into the broader theme of great power competition today, uh, which is that certain choices that we are likely to make uh, in the future to augment deterrence, let's say against China, will necessarily have consequences for North Korea. One example I'll provide here, um, the United States now is no longer a party to the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, and we are currently developing several conventional precision strike platforms intended for deployment to the Indo-Pacific, primarily with targets in China in mind. However, there's no real way to deploy these capabilities to the region without 
considering that North Korea will inherently view these as a threat to the survivability of its nuclear forces, the uh, integrity of its regime. Um, and so those steps, I think, uh, again, will merit consideration in, in thinking about nuclear risks uh, more broadly in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and finally, before I end my remarks, I also want to talk a little bit our, about our alliances. Um, so in 2017, when North Korea tested uh, an ICBM for the first time, again, a rudimentary capability, I'm not saying that their ICBMs are, are robust and reliable to the extent that ICBMs are elsewhere. Um, but nevertheless, they introduced the threat of alliance decoupling to Northeast Asia. Uh, and I think this has implications for nuclear hedging behavior uh, in, in Japan and South Korea. Uh, and I think this takes on particular relevance as we await the uh, final results of uh, our presidential election here. Um, but we need to remember why decoupling matters. Uh, we, we need to remember the non-proliferation implications of extended deterrence. We don't we don't extend our deterrence to Japan and South Korea uh, out of altruism or because we like them or because they're like-minded democracies. We do it uh, in part to prevent further nuclear proliferation in Northeast Asia, and we do it to protect our own interests. And I think there will be a lot of hard work uh, that that will be around the corner in terms of shoring up these alliances, ensuring that our conventional and nuclear deterrence postures vis-a-vis uh, -vis North Korea are are, are robust enough such that North Korea can't hope to leverage its nuclear weapons for coercion. Uh, this has been the longstanding uh, debate among pessimists and optimists uh, of North Korean nuclear strategy, uh, the concern being that North Korea's treasured sword, uh, the, uh, the moniker that the North Koreans themselves use for their nuclear forces, that the treasured sword is not simply designed to remain in its sheath and intended to be used for um, existential deterrence, but that North Korea may actually seek to unsheath its treasured sword and brandish it for coercive ends. Um, there's some evidence that North Korea may seek to do this. For instance, uh, in August 2017, we saw the North Koreans toy a little bit with nuclear compellents when uh, Kim Jong-un threatened to bracket the U.S. territory of Guam with four Hwasong-12 intermediate range ballistic missiles uh, if the United States did not cease bomber operations from Guam. Uh, that, of course, uh, did not, that threat was never carried out, uh, but it was an interesting example of the North Koreans, I think, testing out what their possession of nuclear weapons might do for their ability to coerce the United States. So that's, I think, uh, something else that we need to be quite attuned to and why the process of risk reduction and managing escalation on the peninsula is going to be more important uh, than ever in the coming years. Um, but this will have to be a process that we manage with our allies. Um, a final recommendation here. So a lot of what I've said, I think, would require a significant rethink of the way in which we conceive of the North Korea problem. Uh, and the major counter argument is that um, by abandoning the non-proliferation framing, or at least putting the non-proliferation framing on the back burner and recognizing that a North Korea devoid of nuclear weapons is not a realistic end state for any diplomatic process in the next decade or so, uh, we risk legitimizing North Korea's possession of nuclear weapons. Um, and the legitimation problem is a serious one because, as we know, North Korea... Uh, is unique in being the only state to have left the NPT, developed nuclear weapons, and effectively gotten away with it. So how do we then prevent blowback on the non-proliferation regime? Um, so we heard a little bit about this from the from the previous speaker. One point here to highlight is that North Korea is by far not the only problem for the non-proliferation regime. I think that does bear stating. Um, but the other example, uh, I think the other point I'd, I'd, I'd highlight is that uh, the legitimacy conversation, I think, sometimes can be a little bit of a red herring. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the only legitimate form of nuclear possession in the international system is being a recognized nuclear weapon state under the NPT, a status that North Korea will, will never attain. Um, and so in the meantime, uh, there are ways in which to posture, uh, particularly the ways in which we discuss North Korea uh, and, and um, uh, uh, basically ensuring that we don't inadvertently confer more legitimacy than we need to. But that doesn't mean that we can't plan, uh, design our deterrence and containment strategies around a realistic appraisal of North Korea's capabilities. Um, so I will end there. I think I'm also a little short on my time, but I'm uh, looking forward to um, hearing from the other panelists and to our discussion later. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Ankit. And another terrific set of comments. Up next, we have John Park. Thank you very much, Professor Panetsky. Uh, my thanks also to Professor Margulis and the Modern War Institute for having me. Uh, we have before us today an important, very helpful central question uh, for us to focus on, and how, to the, how the U.S. can impose costs and disrupt adversaries without resorting to war. My remarks uh, regarding the North Korea challenge are going to be in two parts. Uh, in part one, I'll focus on the diagnosis of how the North Korea challenge mutated and adapted to make very significant strides in its nuclear-armed ICBM program. 
This is the story of North Korea Incorporated and how we unintentionally sparked its growth and its resilience. We need a clear baseline understanding of this phenomenon in order to develop a detailed and tailored response when it comes to imposing costs and disrupting the North Korean regime short of war. In part two, based on this diagnosis, I'll outline specific ways in which we can develop a tailored policy to address the North Korea challenge. Here, it's important to keep in mind that the very commercial networks that enable the managers of North Korea Incorporated to adapt to sanctions also present a target-rich environment for imposing costs on and disrupting the Kim regime. So let's start the deep dive here with part one on diagnosis. With respect to sources, I'm basing my remarks on key findings from seven years interviewing business managers of North Korea Incorporated. This is the North Korean regime's network of elite state trading companies. The most recent part of the study was conducted with Dr. Jim Walsh of MIT. Rather than using a national security focused research methodology, we applied the Harvard Business School case study model. This enabled us to map out a protagonist process for solving a business problem. As researchers, this model enabled us to better understand the business practices, business partners, and business pathways employed by North Korean Incorporated manager. We were then able to see the national security implications of these North Korean innovations, specifically with respect to the unintended impact of sanctions. So in a nutshell, if you think of sanctions as antibiotics and the North Korean regime as a target organism, you get a better sense of how increasing the dosage of antibiotics had two effects. The first was intended, which was the initial disruption of North Korean procurement activities by raising the cost of doing business for a target. It became harder for the North Korean entity to find a supplier or business partner because it was scared off by these sanctions. The second effect was counterintuitive. More sanctions may key North Korean entities better at procuring dual use or banned items. How? For the uber elite members of North Korea Incorporated, they had access to proceeds from the North Korean regime's massive coal trade with China from the late 2000s into the early 2010s. In the marketplace in China, enterprising local companies sought out North Korean clients with a simple proposition. I know you're the target of increasing sanctions. I can procure the item, the component you're seeking, but you're going to have to compensate me for the additional risk in this transaction. That proposition translated to significantly higher commission fees. What we saw was a monetization of risk, which resulted in more efficient markets for North Korea Incorporated. For these uber elite North Korean actors, they could pay the higher commission fees from slush funds from the earlier coal trade. Under PRC law, the vast majority of bilateral commercial deals with North Korea is labeled as benign economic development activities. In all of the major UN Security Council resolutions, economic development is carved out along with humanitarian efforts as permitted activities. This legal loophole in practice is a direct outgrowth of the three agreements that then Chinese Premier Wen Jiabao signed with Kim Jong-il and Pyongyang in October of 2009. These formidable commercial channels are striking because of their normalcy in the PRC marketplace. North Korea Inc. is hiding in the open, benefiting from the sheer volume of commercial activities in the overall PRC economy. Moving to part two, let's focus on what we can do leveraging this diagnosis. If our realistic goal is to slow down the vertical proliferation of North Korea's nuclear ICBM program, we have an opportunity to disrupt the business operations of North Korea Incorporated. In practice, North Korea Incorporated functions much like a family office. In Washington, in Wall Street terminology, a family office is a team of uh, financial professionals who provide advice and services to help families manage, grow, and transfer their wealth to future generations. They are problem solvers and solution finders basically the fixers of an ultra high net worth family's wide array of complex issues. In the North Korean context, the function of family office is a rather recent phenomenon. This coincided with the spectacular accumulation of family wealth in the late 2000s to early 2010s period. The booming coal trade then with China directly filled the coffers of the Kim family, the top of the 1%. This lucrative coal trade did not have a direct impact on the livelihood of the 99% in North Korea though. The first proposal I put before this group is scaling up the application of data analytics. Innovative research groups like the Center for Advanced Defense Studies have convincingly demonstrated that data analytics can be a powerful tool in mapping out North Korea Incorporated's current business partners and nodes. The second proposal is harnessing the power of a largely underused policy tool in the North Korean context, which is incentives. We need to diversify the policy toolkit so that we're not solely dependent on economic coercion, most often in the form of sanctions. Combining data analytics can provide details of who North Korea Incorporated's primary business partners are and what specific items 
they're seeking to procure on behalf of North Korean clients. With this commercial information, it may be possible to structure a monetary reward system to incentivize those in these multi-layered business deals to essentially earn a double payday. The first is a commission fee paid by a Chinese private company on behalf of a North Korean client for an activity like providing logistics. The second payday is a monetary reward for divulging those logistics details. The third proposal is publicly disseminating information about the public holdings the business holdings of senior officials in the North Korean regime. Over a decade ago, the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and Bloomberg put together an impressive series of articles on the business holdings of senior Communist Party of China leaders. With rich detail, they provided a fascinating picture of how each senior official's family inner circle had a net worth in the billions calculated in US dollars. Because of the China market connection, we have opportunities to conduct a similar exercise for the upper echelons of the 1% in North Korea. Why would this be significant? Rumen provides snapshots among the elites in North Korea of what powerful officials have in terms of wealth. Data analytics can provide a more sophisticated and detailed picture. For KJU, this type of transparency inhibits his ability to manage rivalries between and among senior officials. This would be an innovative form of imposing costs on the regime. This disruptive commercial intelligence would likely increase competition. One feature that is common for the two Koreas is intense and at times toxic benchmarking among those in the respective elite groups because access to wealth transfers and translates to influence. In closing, the one concept I'd like to leave you with is North Korea Incorporated. Tracking how it mutates, adapts, and thrives enables us to better understand how KJU is able to use this formidable policy tool to advance his Pyongyang goals. Pyongyang refers to the parallel development of North Korea's economic base and North Korea's nuclear deterrent for self-defense. With this deeper understanding, we can also devise ways to turn this unique strength into a vulnerability for the Kim regime. We can do so through deliberate experimentation with prototype policies. I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, our, our final speaker, before we get to uh, some moderated questions and then audience questions, is Susan Thornton. So without further ado. Well, thank you very much, Michael, and thank you uh, for including me in this fascinating conversation. Uh, I've really appreciated hearing all of the comments to date and uh, look forward to the discussion very much. My uh, remarks will reflect my experience, which is more as a generalist and more on the diplomatic side and more looking at this problem through the lens of the regional diplomacy and how we've come to where we are now and where we might go in the future. I'm very intrigued by comments by Dr. Park and uh, Dr. Panda and others about sort of varying tacks we might take right now. But the fact of the matter is we've been confronting this North Korea problem for quite a long time. And the problem is only becoming more complicated by North Korea's changing capabilities and also by complicated changes in the international picture and changes in US leverage. Um, we've already heard a lot of comments about the US DPRK dynamic, but I'll try to talk a bit more about the regional and the global picture on North Korea and focus on the diplomatic prospects. And um, since I heard part of the preceding panel, um, I'll just note that the Iran and North Korea issues are not unrelated, although they're different in important aspects. I, I think, frankly, the most important question, and, um, and Ankit raised this, is, you know, what is our goal? So up to now, and it's, it's good that the, um, the ambit of this conference is how to impose costs short of war. So I think that implies that one of our goals is to avoid conflict um, on the Korean Peninsula. And I think that that should be one of our goals and has been one of our goals. Um, but the second goal, of course, is to stop the nuclear program or at least to reduce the threat from this program. And I think, uh, you know, prior to recent conversations, the stated and unstated goal was always to uh, eliminate the nuclear program now uh, people are talking uh, about possible other goals, but we also have to think about, you know, what is the North Korean goal? And that's been raised also already today, but the, the, the ultimate goal is really regime security and stability and legitimacy. 
Um, and I think, you know, as uh, Ankit said, you know, this issue for them is infinite. I mean, the, the nuclear program provides this, which is the key uh, for the regime. So um, you might think it would have been good to make progress on this problem before it came as complicated as it is today. Uh, but, you know, the problem is the U.S. has really never been able to settle on what its goal is in, in the North Korea issue. We've stated that we want to eliminate the nuclear program um, and that it should be to deter conflict um, and stabilize uh, the situation on the peninsula, uh, eventually getting to a denuclearized Korean peninsula. But in the past, we've not really been able to countenance lending legitimacy to the North Korean regime. And so we've really vacillated on what the goal is, um, which has been reflected in our diplomacy um, on and off over the years. I think South Korea actually has the same problem. It's been very divided on the issue of how to approach North Korea and the nuclear program and the entire suite of problems that North Korea presents. Um, and I think the ROK's position is essential. It hasn't always been aligned with ours in the details, and that's been a crucial feature of our off and on, off and on diplomacy. Uh, one thing I want to bring up is that um, I thought a positive aspect of uh, the Trump administration's unique approach, if you will, to this issue was that they were able to break through in a way the legitimacy issue by meeting directly with Kim Jong-un. And I think this would be politically difficult, if not impossible, for any other U.S. president to do. Um, and I think, you know, the fact of the matter is that these regime change uh, threats are very real in the minds of the North Korean leadership. And that, you know, meeting directly and conferring legitimacy in that way is one way of conveying that this is not your goal. Um, unfortunately, of course, it's impossible to conduct a detailed negotiation on what you're trying to accomplish at the top level, which we also saw in the efforts of this administration to make progress on this issue. Um, in North Korea's case, I think it's very difficult to conduct a negotiation at any level below the top level. So the communication as a result is always poor to non-existent and the misperceptions are natural and very difficult to dispel. Um, I think um, the sort of other area I wanna talk about is where does the US have leverage on North Korea and what are some out of the box ways we might be thinking about this issue? Um, because, you know, our list of wants and demands is very long. Most of the previous speakers have talked about the nuclear program, but actually in uh, discussions on North Korea policy, the nuclear program is usually the first thing that's raised, but it's never the last thing that's raised. And in fact, I think if we just talk about the nuclear program now without talking about delivery systems, um, most people in the community would probably not accept that um, that you can that you can talk about just um, the elements of the nuclear program without also talking about eliminating elements of the uh, rest of the program, the delivery systems and the missiles. So, uh, in addition to all of the follow-on issues that come up, and which people who have worked on this issue for many years will be quite familiar with, with respect to North Korea's egregious human rights uh, performance, uh, North Korea's taking of US hostages, et cetera. So, um, you know, we always have a very long list of things that we want, and we don't have a lot of leverage, which has been a big problem for our negotiating position. Um, I think uh, if you think about what a more realistic approach might look like, first of all, we have to make sure that we can prioritize what it is that we are asking for in the negotiation. And, um, you know, we have said that we want to focus on denuclearization, but we haven't all, always in practice um, stuck to that position. I think it's very difficult politically in the U.S. to stick to this position, which explains why it's been so difficult. But if you have um, leadership in the U.S. that can convince the community, and it's a it's a big and diverse community that 
that you're going to go after the nuclear program and get them to sort of come along with you on that, I think you need to create a really big coalition that we haven't had for the last several times we've tried this. Um, second, I think we need to increase leverage. And this is a real problem that many people have focused on. Um, Tom Park has focused on it. Um, others have focused on it. You know, the question of what we can do about sanctions. I personally think that um, the sanctions effort was at its maximum potential leverage and effectiveness in the early part of the Trump administration when they were doing maximum pressure. The, the coalition, the international coalition on sanctions in 2017 was as robust as anything I can imagine getting realistically in the future. Um, and I don't see how, any, how it could be increased meaningfully with any uh, added effectiveness. So I, I have doubts about the uh, efficacy and effects of increased sanctions, not to mention the fact that North Korea has shown um, that it's quite able to operate in and around sanctions. And I'm not convinced there's much we can do to um, mitigate that in spite of John's good presentation. And I'd like to hear more about his proposals. Um, but second, you know, can we make uh, military threats as a way of increasing leverage? You know, that was something that was tried also in 2017 with the Trump administration, this idea of a preemptive strike, a bloody nose strike, et cetera. Um, you know, it seems to me that this proved to be something that uh, wasn't really available to us, uh, given our positioning and alliance with the South Koreans and given the potential high costs of, of such, a, um, such an attempt. So um, there may be other ways to um, pursue this kind of um, offensive military maneuver, uh, but uh, the one that was proposed and considered and pondered in 2017 um, turned out to not be very effective. Um, I guess the third area of looking to increase leverage for the U.S. would be to try to enlist others. And, you know, many people have talked about getting China to do more, um, but maybe there are others that might do more. And um, as I mentioned, though, I think in 2017, that was the point at which we had maximum support from the international community to really do something about the North Korea threat. I'm not saying we couldn't get there again, but it will be very difficult to get there again. The, the level of effort and the co co coalescing of different factors in the international community on this issue were such that I think uh, that was the maximum pressure point. Um, and then I guess fourth, people have talked about carrots. You know, we could try to think of things that North Korea wants. Um, legitimacy, as I mentioned, is, is one of the things that uh, clearly is craved. And um, they also are seeking, you know, security. Um, maybe there's an element here of looking for economic options. I do think they are probably not very comfortable with their dependency on China. Um, so, you know, to try to offer an alternative option or alternative um, uh, sort of partnership for them so that they wouldn't have to be so dependent on China would be something that would be attractive, but I'm not convinced that they would want to pay a lot for that. And um, we've tried this also with respect to South Korea being that partner and hasn't, uh, it hasn't proved very durable. Um, and maybe not attractive enough. Uh, so in any case, I think um, one of the problems we have, and then this is sort of my, my last point, um, it's unfortunate that now we're on the fourth go round with North Korea on this issue um, because we've lost a lot in the process and there's a lot of history here. and you know, we can't just think that we're going to start a new negotiation with a new administration and think that there's, you know, that the North Koreans are going to like, oh, it's a blank slate and we're going to start over now. I mean, the history is, is not very helpful to prospects for progress in a negotiation on this issue. 
Um, you know, the first deal we had with the North Koreans, the agreed framework was the best deal that, um, you know, we were going to get. And every time we've gone back and tried to sort of negotiate a new deal, we've gotten less far along, I would say. So, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know if we could negotiate threat reduction, which is something that people are talking about now. Um, and I don't know if there's anything that we could uh, change in the leverage calculus that would be audacious. Um, but I think that the, you know, the objectives certainly that we should be going for at this point is to keep extended deterrence, block pr proliferation activity if we can figure out how to best do that. Um, and then there are other alternatives that have been proposed. I mean, this administration, Donald Trump has uh, talked about taking troops off the peninsula. That's obviously something that the North Koreans would probably be, um, you know, positive about. Uh, I don't think that that's what we should do. I think we've done things like this in the past and it's, it would leave a huge temptation for North Korean aggression. And then we'd have to come back in and the cost would be um, prohibitive. Um, I don't know if we could offer some kind of a security guarantee to the North. This has been proposed before as well. Uh, many people have said, you know, this would be a reward for bad behavior. This is an odious regime. Would a security guarantee from the U.S. be credible? But um, I think, you know, these are all things that have been thought of before. And I mean, I, the reason we haven't solved this problem is not because people haven't been thinking of all kinds of different alternatives and trying to come up with creative solutions. It's, it's just an incredibly difficult uh, set of problems. Uh, I don't know if there are new capabilities that we could deploy that would pressure North Korea short of war. Uh, Ankit Panda mentioned the deployment of um, new systems in the Indo-Pacific. Um, I think, you know, I'm not sure how effective threats um, w from new systems would be about sowing doubt in this North Korean mind about their reliability of their, of their deterrent. Um, I think they would probably work very hard to evade, um, you know, any kind of new uh, roadblocks that we might think we could put up to their deterrent. Um, so I just uh, think that the diplomatic road is going to be very difficult. And I think our uh, diplomacy, unfortunately, has been a bit muddled by uh, the lack of a goal. And I'm not that convinced that we're going to be able to come up with a consensus goal within the US community, never mind within the global community on how we should move forward. So I hope somebody can convince me that there's a more perspective way forward, but that's uh, how I'm seeing it from where I sit. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, what an excellent set of comments from our panelists. Uh, it is 1218, we're wrapping up by 1245. So here's how the remainder of our session will, will go. Um, those of you in the audience, please use the hand function uh, or type your question in the chat. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible. No guarantees, and I, I won't be monitoring it until I ask uh, these questions. And for the panelists, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pose two questions. You can answer one, both, or, or neither, but we'll, I'll pose them at the same time, and then we'll go in the order in which you all spoke. Hopefully that's okay. Question one is that you know, Susan mentioned the U.S. has been unwilling previously to legitimize the North Korean regime, and obviously that changed with the Trump administration. Does this make it easier for the next president, whether that's, you know, after Trump, whether that's Joe Biden uh, this cycle or, or afterwards, uh, to negotiate? Uh, or if they didn't want to legitimize the North Koreans, can we put the genie back in the bottle? After all, the photo ops exist. The North Koreans might use it as a baseline. So how, how does that dynamic play out for future presidents now that Trump has kind of broken that new ground? Second question uh, is, Ankit talked about security dilemma dynamics. And I'd be remiss if I didn't kind of pick up on this in the panel on great power competition. So what are those trade-offs as the US begins to think about maybe specifically competition with China? You know, what kinds of trade-offs would we foresee when challenging China in the South China Sea or the Korean Peninsula or elsewhere, uh, and also trying to negotiate 
uh, some kind of settlement or understanding with the North Koreans? And is it possible to address the so-called China challenge and also get cooperation from China on North Korea? Or are these things really incompatible with one another? So again, you could take uh, either one or one or both, and we're going to go in the order. So we'll start with Dr. Menta. Well, thank you so much to the rest of the panelists for uh, such an invigorating conversation, um, and as well as to Dr. Nancy for, Nancy for these two questions. Um, I'm going to try to answer both of them, but I'll probably give unsatisfactory answers in part because I think, as um, uh, Dr. Jordan Thornton laid out, this is a, a really challenging problem that numerous presidents, numerous policy makers have tried to address over the past decades, and we've never really come close. Um, but I think that, uh, especially when it comes to the question of legitimacy, um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure that this was the stopgap or this was the, the sort of limitation or the, uh, the limiting factor. I think that it does play a role. Um, obviously, the fact that President Trump went to um, Hanoi and Singapore for these summits was unprecedented, although I'm not exactly sure that that was what was preventing um, the United States or other countries from trying to reach a settlement with the North Koreans. Um, in terms of what happens in the future, my hunch is that um, the next president, uh, especially if it's uh, President Biden, uh, Vice President Biden, um, I think he's going to sort of bypass this legitimacy question and try to reach to the sort of substantive fundamentals of a negotiated process, whether it's trying to figure out what has to be part of a settlement, if it's uh, a sort of a containment strategy or um, identifying opportunities um, to ensure the safety of a North Korean program, to limit the spread of uh, North Korean nuclear technology or sensitive materials outside the country. I think that it's going to, we're sort of going to have to put aside the legitimacy question. I think that the genie is out of the bottle, so to speak. Um, and I think that if it, uh, President Trump does win re-election, my sense is that he's going to return to the international stage. He's going to redouble the efforts to have these sort of um, superficial or showcasing performative um, efforts with the North Koreans is probably not going to do much on the actual substance and substance of the negotiations or on reaching any sort of deal with the North Koreans. Um, but I, I don't. I think the legitimacy question is sort of uh, is, is moot, at least from my perspective at this point. Um, with regard to China, yeah, this is a tough question in part because we're always sort of weighing the different dynamics um, at the same time. We have a whole host of regional concerns in the South China Sea. We have our allies to worry about, especially with what we're seeing as a, a sort of uh, an encroaching and an, an increasingly aggressive China, aggressive China, especially with regard to Hong Kong. Um, if there were to be any changes with regard to Taiwan, that would obviously necessitate the United States to get involved, given our extended return agreement with the Taiwanese. Um, I think that there are going to be ways in which we can uh, identify opportunities or, for cooperation and um, collaboration on the North Korean issue. Um, but my hunch is that this is more likely to be successful um, uh, with President Biden, especially given some of the more increasingly aggressive rhetoric between President Trump and China, especially during the midst of the pandemic. I think a lot of the conversations we've seen there have suggested that the already tense uh, dynamics between the two countries, especially um, with tariffs and other uh, economic trade policies, have only made this conversation about security dilemma dynamics and trade-offs even more challenging um, in the future. Uh, so thank you for these questions. I'm looking forward to hearing what the rest of the panelists uh, think about these as well. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Ankit, over to you. Great. Right, thanks. Uh, terrific questions. Um, let me let me be a little provocative on the uh, legitimacy question. Um, so let's concede that the Singapore summit and the, and the Singapore process and the Hanoi process had a legitimizing effect on the Kim regime. Um, but I would suggest that the effects i mean if our if our priority is uh stability on the korean peninsula uh reducing the risks of nuclear escalation that legitimizing effect might actually contribute to those objectives uh in the sense of attenuating north korean insecurity about p potential regime change objectives and certainly if we go back to 2017 and we look at some of the rhetoric uh on our side um we couldn't rule out that regime change was not a short-term objective for the united states and i think north korea uh, if we um, look at commentaries that they were putting out that year in their state media, uh, which which are often done with a with a strategic purpose in mind, 
uh, we would see repeated references to the uh, Iraq war, the uh, campaign to um, overthrow Gaddafi in Libya in, in, in 2011. Um, and certainly this is why the North Koreans were so incensed when uh, the former national security advisor, John Bolton, made a reference to a, a Libya model for North Korea. Um, so legitimacy, of course, has its causes, and the nonproliferation consequences are, I think, the, the best understood. We don't want to legitimize North Korea's possession of nuclear weapons because we don't want uh, to set a uh, or to support a norm that proliferation can pay off uh, if, uh, if, a, if a proliferator persists uh, over, over decades, as North Korea has done. Um, but if the if the short term stability consequences are positive, does that then open new doors for us if we assure North Korea that our objective is not regime change in the short term? I think there is something to this. I mean, our, our current declaratory policy on, on the matter of the Kim regime, at least as stated in the Trump administration's 2018 nuclear posture review and other documents, is that any use of nuclear weapons by North Korea will result in the end of the regime. Uh, and, and we will use any and all means necessary to make that happen. And uh, that's, of course, something that we not only say to reduce nuclear escalation risks, but also to reassure our allies. Um, so that can remain the basis of American policy, uh, in, indicating that Kim can, as, you know, as long as North Korea possesses nuclear weapons, as long as those weapons are not used, we will not make, we will not take affirmative steps uh, in peacetime or, or even in a crisis to preemptively uh, decapitate the regime, so to speak. Um, and I think, and I think that is a, a useful posture. Um, and I should probably explain why. Um, I think this, I mean, North Korea's nuclear strategy, in my understanding, which is based on multiple sources, including uh, North Korea's own uh, declaratory statements on nuclear weapons, um, just a strategic analysis of North Korean capabilities, is that they are oriented to use their nuclear weapons first to degrade the ability of the United States and our allies to conduct offensive operations uh, against its territory. Uh, so they've observed how the United States executes expeditionary wars. Uh, they've observed the importance of logistics and, and resupply, and they intend to make that a very difficult task through the use of nuclear weapons. Um, so by attenuating these risks, uh, we, I think, increase our chances of avoiding uh, or at least reducing the salience of nuclear weapons in a potential future crisis with North Korea. Uh, a lot of the discussions we're having these days, I think, uh, make the assumption that uh, we are oriented towards negotiation and cooperation with the North Koreans because that was our most recent experience in 2018 and 2019, but that's not assured at all. Uh, the North Koreans have just shown us new missiles. They may choose to test that soon to launch a, a new cycle of, um, of conflict and, and tensions. Shifting to the second question on China, I do think that the intensification of great power competition with China will make it more difficult for us to cooperate on the North Korea question. Uh, in fact, I find it difficult to imagine if we do return to another round of pressure that we will be able to win China support at the UN Security Council for uh, additional sanctions, uh, because I do think the Chinese will have a diagnosis for the next round of crisis, which was going to be that the United States was too rigid in the 2018 and 2019 negotiations with North Korea, particularly in our reluctance in Hanoi to take the offer that North Korea had put on the table, or some variant thereof, if not that exact offer. Um, apart from that, though, I think the issues, uh, and, and we heard about this from Dr. Park on the um, issue of sanctions implementation, the ability of North Korean financial actors to uh, enjoy all the benefits of uh, unrestricted activity within the Chinese financial system. I think a lot of that, the incentives for China to uh, better implement those measures will, I think, decrease considerably. Uh, we already know about illicit ship-to-ship -ship transfers, for instance, that North Korean um, vessels uh, undertake within Chinese territorial waters. Uh, so activities like that, I would suspect, are likely to continue. Uh, and it's also worth remembering that China's strategic interests on the peninsula include the avoidance of a conflict uh, and include the um, avoiding the total collapse of the North Korean regime. Uh, and if you're China looking at how North Korea is coping with COVID and looking at North Korea's frankly quite difficult year with uh, multiple rounds of flooding, environmental damage, Kim Jong-un falling short on many of his economic objectives, um, and taking into account the broader recalibration of the China-North Korea relationship uh, beginning in March 2018 with the first uh, Xi Jinping-Kim Jong-un meeting and beyond. Uh, overall, I think we will see China and North Korea be a lot more on the same page, uh, while keeping in mind that the North Koreans certainly don't take their marching orders from Beijing, that they have their mistrust of Beijing. But I think, uh, you know, we look back to... Uh, how North Korea maneuvered during the Cold War and how North Korea maneuvered during the Sino-Soviet split. This is a country that excels in maneuvering great power competition and leveraging powers against each other. And I suspect Kim Jong-un will keep that in mind uh, in the coming years. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, John, over to you. 
Thank you. Uh, great comments all around. And, and uh, just to add to those, uh, I think when it comes to these two questions, uh, I just wanted to very quickly uh, address them, but through the lens of the marketplace of proliferation. You know, Ankit mentioned uh, that as well, and Ankit's been doing great research in this area as well. Uh, and there's a growing community that looks at this space because there are a lot of inconvenient facts and truths. Every time North Korea has conducted a test, not only the recent ones, uh, there is always a round of sanctions. And so if you look at uh, the sanctions component, you have to legitimately ask, you know, have we kind of run out the use of sanctions here? Uh, our, our approach to it is not only in some instances have we run out the use of sanctions, but it's sparking this kind of innovation because of this monetization of risk. So when it comes to legitimacy of North Korea, in the neighborhood, it is legitimate. And particularly from the lens of how, you know, the party to party, the China, North Korea party to party interactions are playing out. And that's in the marketplace of proliferation, the development of political relationships and the monetization of political relationship. That's a very powerful relationship in terms of how you're able to convert that to growing business. It's not just a function of the North Koreans sneaking around in the Chinese marketplace. Actively, you have local Chinese companies seeking out North Korean uh, clients for these lucrative deals. The second part about trade-offs, uh, this as we heard, uh, you know, this is the aspect of a complex problem becoming even more complex. But the fundamental truth here is that the Chinese authorities are concerned about North Korea's expanding uh, program, not directly because of the feeling that China feels the threat from North Korea's capabilities, but rather how North Korea's continued path along these lines can trigger uh, likelihood of some kind of escalation and potentially conflict uh, with the United States. But from the angle of national interest, uh, there are demonstrated cases where Chinese authorities, particularly law enforcement, are trying to stop uh, some of these illicit activities. The problem is just sheer volume of these trade and commercial activities. If you posit, you know, small percentage of this is for the illicit uh, transactions, tracking them down has been enormously difficult for uh, the law enforcement capability side. And this is where I think they're, they're potentially through that lens of national interest and how they overlap. Uh, there could be areas for cooperation, but at the senior levels and the trade-off that you mentioned, uh, it makes that type of uh, cooperation, even discrete cooperation, very difficult in the current climate. Thank you so much. And Susan, over to you. And then we'll throw it open to, we have one uh, question in the chat so far. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to duplicate what other people have said. I think a lot of very good comments have already been made. Um, I do think it's going to be more difficult for a non-Trump president to meet with Kim Jong-un, but that's not uh, the biggest uh problem. I think the problem is connecting that high level diplomacy, which could be useful in a future scenario where we're trying to get somewhere with North Korea, connecting that diplomacy to the actual working level diplomacy. And, you know, we haven't maybe done as good a job as we could do on this, but I can't really put the blame on our side because on the North Korean side, I think there's a huge disconnect and they, they don't have a system that handles this very well. So, um, so that would be the point I would make on that. On the China cooperation and cooperation from not just China, but from others, but China is obviously the most important. I think what Ankit said about the North Koreans being professionals at driving wedges between different countries and getting what they can from each angle is, is something that we really need to keep in mind, which is why uh, you really have to focus on keeping everybody on the same page uh, I don't think the Chinese are going to be very motivated to show a lot of cooperation if we're um, having contestation in a lot of other areas that are sensitive to them. But I do think they have their own interests on North Korea. And so there are some areas where they overlap, obviously. Um, I just think that the, the main thing that they're looking at is stability and keeping basically North Korea, the North Korean regime afloat. Um, and so if that's uh, something that at some point we find to be problematic, we're going to be on, on uh, different, different sides on that. Fantastic. Thank you. So I'm going to read uh, the first question in the chat from Edward, and then I'll uh, read the question from Leif. So the question from Edward to the panel is, does the U.S. have enough patience to realistically exploit values, soft, smart tools as a positive approach to rogue states as opposed to hard tools? Is this a national game or an international solution would take slow and painful diplomacy? I'm going to interpret that to mean, you know, kind of a, a subset of questions. What is the balance between kind of soft power and other kinds of carrots and incentives versus military power? And also, what can the United States accomplish on its own versus accomplish internationally or multilaterally 
which may be harder, as I think Ankit was mentioning, with China and the Security Council and so forth. So anyone on the panel can take it. If we have two people speaking uh, at the same time, I'll point to one of you and then uh, go to another. So Ankit, why don't you go first? Great. Yeah, I'll just make a I'll make a very narrow point about the soft toolkit that we have. Um, and again, you know, people can probably tell that I think a lot about nuclear stability issues. So one of the proposals that that was mooted in in 2019 and actually came up at the Hanoi summit uh, is this idea of the United States setting up a liaison office uh, in, in North Korea, in Pyongyang. Um, uh, Sweden has already, um, a, a, the Swedish embassy has already carved out some real estate for this uh, within their facilities. Of course, COVID makes this more challenging, but all we'd have to do is set this up with the North Koreans. It's been it's been actually an objective that was part of the agreed framework, believe it or not. This is something we've been talking to the North Koreans about for a long time. Um, but let's let's then work through the positive effects that might follow from that. Um, negative effects, I think you could imagine the criticisms, legitimation, uh, setting up a liaison office does have that effect. Uh, we can perhaps revisit some of the um, arguments that we were hearing um, in the late Obama administration over Cuba, for instance. Um, but the positive effects, I mean, uh, from the North Korean perspective, and, and you know, North, uh, North Koreans have mentioned this in uh, track twos and, uh, and track 1.5 dialogues, uh, is that at some level it would give them a level of assurance if you you know had American uh, American citizens in Pyongyang that the United States would not launch a preemptive attack on North Korea, um, and of course you know to many of us uh, this this uh, this North Korean fear of a bolt out of the blue attack seems a little. Um, over paranoid, but I think as we know, uh, you know, states tend to re reason about their own security, and particularly authoritarian states that fear regime change tend to reason about their own security in worst case scenario terms. So I think this is a this is a clear example of a soft measure that I think would have real measurable crisis stability implications. Um, that that the North Koreans would 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 be more confident that the United States would be less likely to take brash action. Uh, there are other act uh, other proposals in this genre, of course, uh, one that was, again, very popular in 2018, uh, late 2018 in particular, after the uh, second, uh, the Pyongyang uh, Inter-Korean Summit, uh, is this notion of a uh, concluding a peace treaty uh, to formally declare an end to the Korean War. Uh, this, again, I think, uh, I'm, a, I'm a little skeptical about the practical value of this, but certainly from a uh, signaling to the North Koreans that we intend to pursue coexistence in good faith and not pursue regime change all all while maintaining deterrence and our alliances in the region um, um, in the region this again could have value so just a couple things to think about that these kinds of measures can contribute to uh, reducing uh, instability in the region thanks so much anyone else Rupal? Yeah, um, I just wanted to tag into this conversation a little bit, and I don't think anyone's in the mood for game theory, uh, especially this morning. But this is actually something that I've been doing some work on recently. And uh, in some new research I'm exploring uh, with a co-author, you know, how we can understand the idea of patience and whether or not the North Koreans and the United States or the international community sort of think about these strategic interactions in different ways, in part because of the nature of the regimes. The North Koreans have nothing but time on their hands. They've had a familial dynasty that has is likely to continue. On the other hand, the United States has term limits where every four to eight years, a new president can come into office with a new set of agenda, a new priority. And in part, that tension or that divergence is what makes this uh, these negotiations incredibly challenging. I think we saw that with Iran. I think we potentially will see that. Um, if there is a, a change in leadership um, in 2020, some of these questions about playing a long game with North Koreans um, were, were sort of at a disadvantage as democracies in part because autocracies have this longer purview and this longer trajectory. And then to, to sort of take on this question of military force versus soft power, um, again, I think this, this is where the data is really informative here. Um, when we look at instances in which there are threats of military force or even um, uh, efforts to develop operational plans of military force, on average, these tend to have really negative and destabilizing effects on the aspirant. And especially, as uh, Ankit mentioned, when we're looking at states that have acquired or has started to um, go down the nuclear path, in part because of security concerns, this is only going to exacerbate those problems. And so I think here, we really do have to look at this as a, as a long uh, term iterative dynamic game where we have to take really slow and often painful steps forward and potentially even some steps back um, to get to the eventual outcome we want, which is stability, whatever that might look like. Thank you. I'm going to exercise moderator privilege and go to our final question uh, and then 
John and Susan, you can answer uh, either or both because in our last five minutes. Uh, the, the last question we're going to take today comes from Dr. Leif Rosenberger, which asks, would Korean economic unification foster or reduce stability in the region? And I want to exercise another moderator privilege and add to that, you know, we've talked a lot about U.S. North Korean relations and multilateral relations, but we haven't talked that much about South Korea. And so what are South Korea's incentives moving forward? Are they aligned with the United States? Are they going to go in a more autonomous, independent um, so maybe I'll throw it open to um, Susan first, and then John, you can take us home. Yeah, um, I, I am always interested in the extent to which our conversations about the North Korea problem only involve U.S. and North Korea most of the time, and maybe sometimes China, but almost always completely neglect um, you know, our South Korean allies who basically have the most major stake in this issue. And one of the things, of course, that, that Donald Trump has, I think, flirted with is why do we care about this you know, Korean civil war? Let's get out of there and let the Chinese and the South Koreans handle it, um, which you know, is anathema to anyone in the US foreign policy community. But yeah, I think has to be, um, thought about and considered one of the things that you know must be said is that the um combination of you know barack obama for eight years when we had pot gune in the south korean uh, presidency so there was a pretty big disconnect in sort of approaches to north korea in that in that combination and now we have donald trump combined with moon jae-in who i think donald trump has made absolutely no secret of um, you know, the, the sort of lack of chemistry, if you will, if, if, if I can put it that way, that he has with President Moon on this issue, and they're pretty diametrically opposed views toward how to approach this problem. So um, I do think, you know, the South Korean view on this and how we line up with them is, is crucially important. Um, North Korea is always looking to diminish, you know, the coherence of the alliance. So that's another thing that we have to be on guard about. And uh, certainly the South Koreans at this point, I mean, if you look around the, 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 the picture on North Korea, um, pretty much everyone might be able to be satisfied with the status quo. But I think the South Koreans are probably the least satisfied with the status quo. And so that gives more urgency to their, to their approach to this issue. On Korean economic unification and whether it's stabilizing, I mean, you would have to understand I mean, I can't even imagine how that would happen, and it would presuppose a set of political arrangements that I also can't imagine, given the North Korean regime and how they feel about, you know, regime security, stability, and their own sovereignty. So, um, you know, we've had experiments with South Korean economic involvement in North Korea. Um, those aren't determinative for the North Korean regime, obviously. So, um, I think it's more the question of sort of the political arrangements between the two Koreas that would be controlling and not the economic connections. Thank you, John, last word over to you. Sure, thanks very much. Uh, very quickly tie in some themes. Uh, you know, again, great points I mentioned and to weave some of them together. Uh, I want to frame you know, my remarks through the lens of sunshine policy. This was something that the progressive government in South Korea launched uh, in the early 2000s. And the idea is through economic engagement, show North Korea a different path. And over time, North Korea would see less and less utility with respect to uh, its nuclear weapons uh, in terms of longer term survival. Uh, clearly, sunshine policy uh, in South Korea uh, has waned a lot. Uh, when we had back to back conservative governments in South Korea, that was essentially the end of uh, sunshine policy. It's come back to a certain extent under uh, Moon Jae in. But uh, the key story here is China's sunshine policy, because if you look at that inflection point, uh, this is a part, as we heard earlier, with China's focus on the stability of the North Korean regime, uh, it's not US centric. I mean, we, we tend to continue to view it from what the US can do. Uh, but I think from this inflection point where the sunshine policy, it wasn't a planned passing of the baton. It clearly is sunshine policy with Chinese characteristics. But that level of interactions really sets for us a reference point. And if, if you think of it, uh, almost something that has its own type of momentum that we have to factor in our calculations as we think of what we're gonna do vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, be it in terms of how we're gonna negotiate, what we're gonna offer, it is now all benchmarked in terms of what's happening in the China-North Korea relationship. 
The caveat is this is not a resurgence of an alliance. This is a very complex, very difficult, mutual animosity, mutual distrust, very dysfunctional relationship. The last point I wanted to talk about was uh, the unification piece. If we run that thought experiment, if Moon Jae-in and the Pyongyang uh, Panmunjom Declaration had gone through the inter-Korean agreements that kind of kicked off the season of summitry that we saw in 2019, had that gone uh, to its full fruition, it's counterintuitive, but we would actually seen the extension of uh, the division of the Korean Peninsula. You would have two independent states peacefully coexisting with each other, perhaps trading with each other, uh, but you would have distinct and, and more rigid, if you if you will, uh, two countries in terms of their structures. And so there, there's a lot of these puzzles and counterintuitive aspects of it, but the bottom line is the stability angle. And there, South Korea and China have, I think, many layers in terms of the various efforts uh, that they've been pursuing with uh, with North Korea. Well, wow, thank you all uh, so much. A big um, virtual round of applause. I know your cameras are all off to uh, Rupal Anki, John and Susan. We really appreciate it. And I'm going to kick it over to Max to talk about the next panel. At 1 p.m. Eastern. So see you there. Thanks, everyone.